Pünktlichkeit. That means we are really punctual. And when I say punctual, I mean punctual. I mean like five minutes late and you're dead punctual. Yeah, that is really important for us in Germany. And I read and I heard that, that people laugh about us all over the world when you say somebody's asking you, what are you doing today? And you say, um, yeah, in five minutes is my next meeting or in three minutes. We are really, we are really punctual. We have watches. We look at our watches all the time. You know, we, we are like synchronizing our watches because that's really important for us. That's a sign of respect. If you have a meeting at 11 p.m., sorry, I'm saying p.m. all the time. If you have a meeting at 11 a.m. and you don't show up, five minutes later, somebody will call you. Um, that is important for us in terms of respect. It also implies a kind of power play in a big company when really the CEO or the boss, the, the boss he will like never be punctual because that's his power play that's his form of showing you that he is way way over you if you have a um, important meeting with a very important person who is over you i mean like three or four levels above you then he will never be punctual that doesn't mean that he's disrespecting you that's just yeah you know, some sort of power play showing that He's really busy and really important, but that's only possible if he or she is really two or three levels above you. In the daily work, you won't work with these people, so you're working with your boss or you're working with people who are below you in the hierarchy, and then you're always punctual. If you're not punctual, you will apologize. If you're only if you're two minutes late, you will apologize. If you don't do that, that's perceived as being rude you know so people will not like you where they will think you're arrogant and you will have a problem you maybe you're not part of the game you're not part of the team now i'm talking only about minutes it also applies to the whole project if you are not punctual in terms of i deliver today but then i don't deliver today you know what i mean It's always a problem. You're an unreliable. Yeah, you know, people will think that maybe they don't want to work with you. If you want to be like a German project manager, then you have to be really punctual and reliable. And uh, if you tell somebody, "I will deliver today at two o'clock," you will deliver at two o'clock. That's really important. And, and if you cannot make it, you will call the guy one hour earlier and apologize and say, "You know, you know." I cannot make it. Also typical for us is being structured. Struktur is the German magic word. We are really structured and we are logical. So we have, uh, as said in another lecture already, we have process for everything. That means we have, uh, for example, you go from A to B and then from B to C and so on. And if you have something with D, you will always know where this is coming from. That structure is really good because we are really uh, efficient then in the long run because obviously we find the errors. We find if we go from B to D and then to E, for example, somebody will say, wait a second, isn't it possible to go directly from A to E, you know? Yeah, that's really typical that we are having process and rules and guidelines for everything. Yeah, of course, we are efficient. Uh, that's what we are known for. It's not like every person in Germany is really efficient. That's not the case. But uh, that's, that's how we think, that's our mindset. Doing everything structured and you show up all the dependencies and then you show up, you know, I saw if we go from there to there to there, everybody will follow you and everybody will um, wants to discuss with you about that because that's how we think. We don't just 
ignore stuff or let stuff play around. Nope. We work on our topics every day. Meaning, if you are responsible for a project or for, for maybe you have to write something, a white paper or a master thesis, then people can rely on that you're working on it constantly. That means, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say like consider it done. That's not like everybody's doing it in Germany, but really people feel accountable. They feel like, you know, that's my job, that's my role, I have to do it. So, and they will execute it until the death. Okay, maybe that's too much. Maybe that's too much uh, war movies. But yeah, we are really accountable. We work on our stuff every day. And so even long, bigger projects are executed through a big time frame or how do you say? It's not really in every country the case that you can say we start a project we start in February and then we work until October and everybody's working on it. So usually in some other countries, you call the people and they are just not doing anything. Maybe that's not nice of me to say that. And of course, we are not all the same. But I would say it's typical for Germany that we have some like bad conscience or we feel bad if we don't work on this stuff. So we, we don't forget. That also doesn't have to mean that we are always doing our best jobs. Maybe other people, they wait more and then they do all at once. But at least we feel bad. If we have a task, we never forget it. And we will be reminded by ourselves or by somebody else later. So, yeah, just keep that in mind that if you have a project with a German guy, you will not forget. And he will maybe even years later, if nobody is talking about the topic, he or she will still feel guilty that the project didn't run or whatever. Everything will be fine if you really work constantly on something and uh, feel accountable for that. We love to make a plan. And of course, we execute it. That means, especially the planning, of course. That's maybe really, really typical for Germany. That's maybe you're joking about it, but we really, we plan our vacation, for example, at least one year ahead. We plan in advance, way in advance. Some people in Germany, of course, they hate it and they, they, they don't like it. They are... Um, of course, that's always the case, but, but it's typical for us. We, we plan stuff and um, that means also that you have a bit like freedom of mind after you plan something. You said, okay, I will go on in February, I will go there, in March I will go there and so on and so on. And you can like looking forward to it really and you can say, I will buy that suitcase for that travel or whatever. Um, but if you work with German people, or maybe if you work, want to work like German people, if you want to try it, you have to get used to that, that we really plan stuff. We have processes. We have like A, B, C, and so on. And it always follows Yes, the master plan. If you say, so we have here responsibility, I'm responsible for B, and that will be done on Tuesday. And the other guy is responsible for C, that will be done on Thursday, of course, right? It makes sense, it's, it's good, because you always know where you're standing at. You can say, you know, I am here, yeah, that's good. And uh, you, you can find errors in your process. You can say, okay, here, that's always two days. So maybe we should improve that. A little bit of the downside is we don't really like changes so much. If you work with German people or don't get mad at us, that's just how we work. We really like to plan the whole week in advance. 
And uh, yeah, it's like a distraction for us if you say like, yeah, let's go to cinema today. Uh, we don't really, cannot really handle it. But at least there are some advantages, as I said at the beginning, it's structured and so on and so on. Get used to it or not. <laughs> Maybe you can do it sometimes or sometimes not, but at least that's how we roll. In Germany, we like to write down things. That means, for example, taking minutes or uh, writing memos or uh, emails and have everything written down in written form because that helps us being structured and being accountable and being uh, reliable. And the word that comes to mind is proto protocol in Germany. Protocol. So we are really working with forms a lot. So um, if you want to marry, for example, you really have to write down 20 forms and everything. And after, I mean, that sometimes takes so long that you're divorced before you even get to marry somebody. That can really drive you crazy. If you want to register a new car, at least, I don't know, you need to take two days off to understand everything. Um, but at least people are usually not corrupt. So that's maybe a bigger problem in, in other countries. So, but not so much in Germany, we're really straightforward. And that uh, writing down of everything also is for us, it secures us, it makes us feel safe. And yeah, it's like, we are a bit like lawyer, you know, we feel like uh, I have to prove that you are wrong and I have to prove I am right because I said it already, I wrote it down. You should get used to that. If you work with somebody from Germany and you're like, you know, I do it and okay. If somebody is not okay in the project, if there's a problem, everybody will ask you, did you write it down? Do you have it in written form? If not, it's your fault. So the written form, the written contract, whatever, that's how it's supposed to be. If you don't do that because you want to work fast, it's your own, at your own risk. That's your problem. Typical for Germany is write down everything, take minutes, make contracts and so on. Um, with your boss, with your employees, in a project, everything you can also turn that argument around. Everything which is not written down is like it didn't happen, you know. And if you have a problem in a project, that one will kill you because if you don't write it down, and of course, I don't do that all the time, that's a little bit like trust. But if you don't write it down, it's always your fault. You should get used to that. You should know when to write down and how to understand if somebody is writing something down for you. Maybe he use different formulation and you think like, ah, oh, whatever, it's your problem later. If he writes your task and you don't read it, it's accepted that you will do the task, right? Get used to it. Try to think a bit of writing down when it's necessary, when not. And I think you will be fine. Germans always try to be perfect. Or at least seem perfect. We don't think that failure is a good thing. We think that failure is something for losers. And uh, everything has to be perfect all the time. So that's a little problem. Because if you work... In a company or the, you are new or you are young then you always think everything has to be perfect because that is how we are raised we don't like to admit errors or failures we don't like tell somebody that we did something wrong because people will attack us and by the way they are searching for somebody who is fault or who is guilty all the time it's not very often that somebody says oh i made a mistake because that's just not how we work. You will always say, yeah, I made, maybe it was not perfect what I made, but the reason was that the other guy told me, you know? So, or you say, I would have done it, 
if not the other guy didn't deliver you know we always try to find the root cause outside of ourselves and you will find somebody who is guilty and of course that's like poison a little bit poison for the environment and the social living and there's enough reason to complain but on the other hand yeah that's part of our culture that means if you are you try to be perfect failure is something really bad you know um, and we always fear if you make a mistake that other people will attack you and they will remember that and i know that this is very different in other countries for example in, in usa you can say you know i tanked three companies and now i am who i am you know so that's like i tank three companies and that makes me strong if you tell that in germany you are like loser but there's maybe little one little exception if you are a, a expert with a very strong self esteem then you can kind of afford that and i will really say expert i, I don't say ceo or manager i say i say expert if you can really say i made a mistake it was my fault and i learned from it and you really say like i believe it and i i carry all the consequences then people will respect you because you're the only one who has the guts to tell that believe it or not but out of 10 people maybe one or out of 20 people maybe one has enough you know self esteem to to say yes i made the mistake i cannot blame anybody else but okay next time i will be better if you say it like this everybody will respect you so i would say the normal strategy or the normal behavior is this failure is bad and if you can go with option two in my opinion it's really good that is something that people will respect i would encourage you to try it ordnung muss sein yes that's really important for us i will write it down for you ordnung muss sein that means in english there has to be order all the time yes we need order everything has to be in place for us so everything has two steps three or four steps and there's an order i will do this you will do next and so on we are thinking processes we are a little bit like robots you know if we work in a project you have your task i have my task and we will do it like step one step two step three that's really important for us that means also um, you are taking control of your own life if you lose something if you lose your car keys it's always your fault yeah and everybody will make jokes of you because you are like a messy you know you are like uh, not able to control your life we tell that all the children that order is important ordnung muss sein we have folders for everything we have a folder for car where we put all the car sheets and stuff and our contracts and our insurance so that order is really important for us and of course that's good because in a project everybody has his role everybody has his responsibilities and you can rely on people if somebody says he wants to send you at 11 am the next day and he didn't deliver five minutes later you will call him that's absolutely clear you know and um i will i'm currently working with people in different countries and uh, yeah if they say i will send you on tuesday maybe they send you on tuesday in other countries that's not like us if if we are not getting that on tuesday we are calling you at midnight and say you said you sent me where is the sheet you know so uh, we are really yeah 
clear on this. Yeah, maybe that's not so good, but it's typical German and we are really reliable. So that uh, word Ordnung or order is super important to us. And you should do it like us if you want to be like us, if you want to be German. What you also have to know is we are really direct. And I mean, straightforward. When it comes to opinions and so on, I know. I told that already sometimes that we like our opinions and so on. We fight with opinions. But in this lecture, I like to talk about that we are really direct. We are not very polite if you make a mistake or so. We just tell you. We tell you that was wrong. You did a mistake. And maybe we will also tell you all the details and really every detail about what you made wrong. And you have to, to learn that and to live with that and to understand that it's not personal that if you made a mistake or if you made something good, it's also possible that somebody will tell you, yeah, good job, you know, but we are really more direct with, uh, uh, let's say, yeah, well, I have a trouble to say with negative things, but Yeah, maybe it is like it is. So if you make um, something good, they will tell you, yes, of course, that's what you're paid for. And if you make something which is not so good, they will tell you every detail. You mistake. Yeah. And then all the people will come and explain you exactly what the problem is. And then they will also tell you why you did it wrong and so on. And they will tell you their opinion. But why is that good sometimes? I don't want to just like talk bad about, about us, about German people. Of course, it's really good that people are direct because you're getting real instant feedback. And uh, I would say if you are taking it personal, And you're like against the people, you know, if you if you say like here, I don't like, I am not happy or I, I'm angry, I'm mad or something. Yeah, of course, that can drive you crazy. But in my opinion, it's a good thing to get direct feedback from everybody directly. And they will tell you in your face that you made a mistake in their opinion. And even if that's not true, you should always learn from it. You can always learn because there's always a reason why somebody is telling you something. It's not that the people are all bad, but they have their own stories. They have their background and so on. And there is some reason that made them think or that you made that, you know. Maybe you come to the conclusion he's just crazy, you know. Or oh, here's another kind of experience, but you will always learn from that and you should really carefully listen. And in my opinion, that's what many people don't do. They just like, ah, I mean, screw them. They can say what they want. I am, I am perfect. It's really hard to accept, uh, to be criticized. But I would say if you work with people from Germany who are direct telling you in your face what you made wrong, You should say like, yeah, interesting, interesting, write that down. What is my, how people perceive me? How do people perceive my, my work? And maybe I can change it next time, maybe not, uh, if I like it. But I have so much feedback and I can learn and I can grow and grow from that over the long run. Typical for us Germans is also... We respect authorities. What are authorities? For example, people with a given power, like policemen, and people who have a lot of knowledge in their fields, for example, yeah, teacher, of course, 
or like uh, professors and so on. Authorities are really important for us. So we learn that when we are ch uh, children, yeah, people are above us. Hierarchy is really important in Germany. That's in all companies. And yeah, let's start with the children. We, we respect policemen. We respect, for example, when we live in a big house, we respect the, the guy who is the janitor because he's like enabling us to live in that and you know and so he's kind of an authority because he can tell us what to do and he can basically maybe kick us out there are laws against disrespecting policemen for example or uh, you know then 20 30 years ago it was normal that the teacher was always right and the, the parents would not fight with the teacher or not argue with the teacher because he's always right What uh, does it mean for you and me in the business? That mindset is still in our genes or in our, yeah, in our mind. We have a really strong hierarchical thinking in Germany. That means that you have a boss and even if the boss plays it like you're on the same level and we drink beer together and we are like, you know, really... Um, modern you know modern mindset but it's still deep inside our thinking that we respect authorities that means if there's really a fight then at the end of the day the boss thinks he's right or let's say he has the right to be right and that means no matter how old you are and no matter how good you are your boss can always treat you like a child. He will look down on you. That's how it is. And sometimes that's extremely annoying, but you have to know that and you have to play that. So if you work in Germany or with Germans, you always have to understand that, that we, we like to complain about our bosses And we like to talk bad about everybody. But if we are in the same room with the boss, he's always like, right. And, you know, he's, yeah, he can treat you like, like boss or like a parent. And, and we respect that. So we, we don't go against our boss. And you, 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 for example, in a business environment, you cannot bypass your boss if you are here and your boss is in the hierarchy above you and he is also a boss of course it's not allowed to talk to that guy directly so if you do that that guy here will have a problem with you You should be really careful because you jump over yeah, one level ahead, you know, which you're not really allowed to. And of course, there are uh, yeah, other examples. And of course, we are getting more and more modern. But deep in our mind, it's like here, it's like described here. And you should always keep that in your mind. In Germany we talk a lot about what could potentially go wrong. Yeah, again, another thing which sounds too bad and really against us, but I would like to explain you why this could be a good thing. As I told you already, we are usually really structured and we try to think end to end. So if somebody explains me something, you go from A to B and so on and so on. And then he explains me his plan. Then I always, or maybe typical German, we always try to think all the, you know, the, the steps between, maybe here I have a step, maybe there's a step between A and B and so on and so on. And we think about what all could potentially go wrong. So that's basically a good thing, I would say. Yes, again, that can be really annoying. If you tell somebody your plan, I will do this and then everybody will tell you the mistakes and the pitfalls and so on. 
that can be really, really annoying. But on the other hand, it's a good thing because again, you can learn from the people and they will tell you things which you maybe didn't think of. So you should be really open-minded and listen to the people, what they tell you. And then you have the opportunity to, to, to learn. It's just simple as that. So again, you shouldn't take it personally. The people will explain you, they will take all the pitfalls and if you're open-minded, you will write everything down. And I can really guarantee you, if you ask 10 people, you will get more than 10 answers. What could go wrong? Why this is a bad idea? Why this will never work? Maybe that's not the really best environment for entrepreneurs or new ideas, <laughs> you know? Yes, we are not really good at that, at taking risks, because everybody will tell us what go, what will go wrong and what went wrong. And after that, they will call you a failure and it can be annoying. But on the other hand, if you, if you like to be objective, you just listen, you write everything down, you will say like, okay, he said that and that and that and that. And if you ask five or 10 people about your new idea, if you don't take it personally, you can get so many ideas and which will really then prevent you to make all these errors because people have good ideas. They are not last just like telling you everything is, is shit, you know. You can imagine that it's sometimes hard to make decisions with that kind of background or backup. <laughs> but you have to understand that all people are biased. Everybody is telling just out of his personal or her personal perspective. Maybe they don't want to lose you. Maybe they are scared that they cannot do what you do. And so they don't want you to be successful because that will remind them that they are not successful and so on and so on. Keep that in mind and try to abstract, you know, try to be ab abstract and um, to understand why they are saying this. But at least they have the right to tell you something and they have sometimes strong information. If they tell you don't go to this company because for three reasons, maybe these reasons are true. Maybe you can ask other people about these reasons. So that being pessimistic or seeing the failure in everything, maybe that's one of the biggest problems of our culture or of our, our economy but maybe it's also one of our biggest strengths. It's simply in our culture. We try to find all the mistakes in order to improve them. We Germans, we love to be reasonable. And it's same thing like in other lectures. It's not that we are really reasonable we try to look like reasonable. We want to be perceived as reasonable. That's really hardwired into our culture. We are the guys who are efficient and effective and everything, and we have process for everything, you know? So we are not like the gut type, like Italians or French people, you know what I mean? For us, it's important to be reasonable. And if a manager has a, um, yeah, idea or uh, he, he uh, tells you what to do he will always have a reason in the in the background that doesn't mean that the reason really exists in german culture it's just not good to to decide out of your gut or out of your experience um for example old people we don't respect old people very much in other cultures old people are really the best because they have so much experience in, in other culture, experience is, is nothing and old people are not worth so much. I'm, I'm really sorry to tell that, yeah, but it's true. And um, the people who are young and fresh and logic and fast thinking and smart, that are the people. In many companies, uh, the bosses are younger than their employees because if somebody gets a little bit older, he often gets replaced by a younger guy, you know, because he's more smart and reasonable and everything. So you have to keep that in mind. Of course, it can be really funny, as I told already, if you have a strong feeling that this is the right decision. 
you can just make an argument that that explains that in a reasonable way but as you can think that's possible with every argument so i can give you any argument and then i can explain a logical chain for that or against that and then it's um who is this, the, the the best you know guy who can explain his arguments best who will win the whole conversation right so you come to a to a conclusion and you always have to have the chain in mind i got from a to b and so on and so on and that's the reasoning so that's what you have to explain later to give you a more concrete and more funny example you cannot just go around and tell you know i come here with bike because i like bike more you know instead of driving to the office with a car i just come to the office with a bike easy right but we germans we don't like to accept that we question everything and then we will ask why and um, are you sick or can, is the car too expensive for you maybe you cannot afford it you know we will ask questions like this and because everybody knows that that these questions will come we explain everything in advance so i would say you know what i bought a macbook air and before questions come i would say it's because I, i got this super deal and i i just bought it for for 800 instead of 1000 euro you know and i can work faster and i will save one hour each each week or each day and i will be super creative and i will earn money and so you have to explain everything and have a thousand reasons and after that the people will say yeah good good that you bought it and of course that can be really funny because you have to explain yourself all the time you can you cannot just buy something and say you know i bought bought that expensive beverage because i like it and then you have to explain yeah because my doctor taught me so <laughs> you know so that, that can be really funny and um, that means for you if you work with somebody in germany you should always try to reason everything i mean i mean not that you uh, fight with him for his reasons i personally don't like that but if you come to a conclusion and you explain i would like to run this strategy then you should explain why and you just use any argument just do something that makes sense and explain everything otherwise people just won't believe you in germany we like to lecture lecture sounds good right but in this case not we like to lecture others If you go over a red traffic light you can be sure that somebody will like tell you that that's not okay maybe there are children around if uh, some child is at the horizon who could possibly see you you're a bad guy you know so that's really a, a, a moral thing i said in another lecture uh, of this course that everybody has an opinion and we talk about our opinions all the time yeah so opinion against opinion um here in this lecture in this video it's a bit about lecturing others so people will always tell you how it's done so they are like we are know it alls i know everything i tell you how it's done and that can be really annoying obviously for obvious reasons if uh, you even if you're an expert everybody will know better and everybody will discuss with you and he will tell you how it's done and um, you can also afford to do that with other people but I, i personally find it rude but if somebody is doing that with you you should always understand that it's not against you don't be mad at them you know we are like like it is we have to lecture others all the time try to get used to it i wouldn't say that there's anything really good about it it's just it's just a little bit of our culture try to keep in mind lecturing others is normal 
it's not personal, you know? Not personal. Just don't take it personal. Okay? And you will be fine. In Germany, we like to rest. No, that's not right. We like to reward ourselves. Hmm. Ah, that's also not right. Let's say we just like to complain and then we go to the doctor and then he's like stay at home for one week. I don't know if that word really exists in English, but we call it like going on cure. The the cure. You go on a like paid vacation for three weeks and your your uh, insurance pays for everything so that's like the, the cure that's typical german i wouldn't say that everybody does that but but it's completely normal the good thing is if you're working really hard and you have something like burnout syndromes pretty sure in other countries they are like okay it's your problem you are kicked out you get fired or whatever uh, we will find another one and in germany we are really sensitive about that if you work too much and you get sick we think that the company is the reason it's the company's fault and that's sometimes really funny if i work too much or i just um, work make a lot of mistakes or i don't know it's it's all my fault and then i get really sick and then i get burnout Everybody will, will think like the company is fault. I will get a, the paid cure by the insurance and I will get money. And, and when I get back, everybody will be super nice to me and will try to get me back on board and so on. So, of course, I'm, I'm making jokes about it, but it's better this way than the other way around. We are super social. We have a super strong social like system and security system and sometimes that's a little bit uh, absurd it's completely normal that if you don't feel good you're like maybe you have a flu you just stay at home for one or two days and in the most companies for one or two days you don't even have to go to the doctor and prove that you're sick it's just they believe you we are also not very <laughs> Emotional. <laughs> Is that good or bad? Tja, that's the question. We are more like cold, um, yeah, logic, you know, things like that. But that's, of course, that's also good. Of course, we like to complain and we talk about people and we chit chat and everything like every human. But when it comes to work, we are we're trying to be straight forward if we don't like somebody and if we don't like the opinion of somebody else we will never say i don't want to work with him because that is again perceived as unprofessional and childish even if you hate somebody you will always still work with him because we are the cold-hearted logic robotic type of guys and that's again something you you really have to understand if you want to get to know us. If you have a big problem with somebody or he has a big problem with you, maybe he will hate you and talk about you bad all the time in, in each coffee break. But when it comes to work, they will at least respect you. So at least give you a chance all the time, all the time. And that, that can be really funny because you can afford to make many mistakes you can make mistakes all the time and other people because they are so professional they want to be professional they are always like yeah maybe he or she yeah okay i don't like her style but i think she's good so you know they, they will also not i wouldn't say i think she's good i don't like her style and but okay i give her another chance because we are so you know like hierarchical so we think our boss must have had a reason to employ him so he cannot be a fraud that is the reason why i have to respect him all the time i don't like him personally but 
it's good like it is, you know? Think about it. It can be really interesting. Yeah, if you have personal trouble with somebody, that will not necessarily affect your business kind of working. And the people will always respect you and give you a second chance. And it also means if you screw something up or if somebody doesn't like you, you don't have to be scared that they will not work with you anymore. That will that will never happen, I guess. Flight plan. That's a really nice concept you should know. It's called flight plan. I read it first in the book by uh, the author Brian Tracy with the same title. And he basically talks about Imagine your life as a flight from A to B. You're now at point A and you want to get to point B. For example, point B is your career, the job you want to get in five years or in 10 years, or the better salary. Yeah, so a nice goal. The thing is, your life is not straightforward all the time. It's like a flight. And in this book, Brian Tracy says that in a flight, 99% of the time, the plane is not directing to the goal. The computer or the pilot has to steer all the time to the left or to the right. Maybe it's only 0.1 degree. But the point is, he does not set up the plane and the plane goes straight to the goal. He has to steer the plane all the time into the right directions. One degree to the left, one degree to the right. So please remember, 99% of the time, the plane is not going into the right direction. There are always corrections necessary. That means, of course, even if you're not heading towards your goal now, you don't know where you will be in 10 years when you do all the corrections every day. For an example, if you want to exercise more, you cannot say, okay, my plan was to exercise every day. I'm just not able to do it. I quit, right? So every day you can steer into the direction. You can say, okay, yesterday I didn't do it, but I will do it today and so on and so on. Never give up, never give up. Always fight against your lassitude. You have to always steer yourself into the right direction. And when we're talking about career, sometimes you don't know what the step is good for. Maybe you made a mistake and you get into trouble with your boss. So you think your plan doesn't work out. The next promotion doesn't work out. That's not necessarily true because you learn something every time. You learn something about your boss. You learn something about yourself and you will be better the next time. You would not have been better if you didn't learn it. I always say for myself, I only practice for the next job. You know what I mean? I practice. I say, not this is my final job. I have to do this for the next 20 years. I allow myself mistakes and I say, okay, these mistakes help me to steer my plane into the right direction. And in the next job, I will do better. So, of course, you shouldn't say that to your boss. But if you say to yourself, I just practice, quote unquote, for the next job. Here I allow myself errors. You know, then you have a more playful mindset of that. It's okay to make errors as long as you correct them later and steer your plane into the right direction. And the good thing is you will always stay flexible. You will learn that change is the only thing which is really constant in your life. You will learn not to rest if everything is too perfect. You know, sometimes everything is perfect and you will learn to accept it and enjoy it and you know that this will not go forever. When I experience something perfect, perfect day, perfect work day, perfect job, when I experience that, then I enjoy it. I really feel it because I know it will be over sometime and I will be prepared for that. Your whole life consists of correcting your course. That's perfectly normal. As long as you have your goals in mind, and you learn from your errors, that's absolutely fine. As long as you can react flexible and are able to change your mind if you learn more, that's absolutely fine. And you follow your flight plan. If you like, write in the comments what your flight plan is. 
Maybe you can tell the other students how you deal with problems and with your own mistakes. I would be super interested to read your experience. The 20 minute speed run. Okay, this is a really nice one. I call it the 20 minutes speed run. This is a technique you can use when you have to do some task and you really don't want to do it. This can be the case if you don't know how to do it or you know how to do it, but you just don't want to do it. Good example is cleaning up or polishing your shoes. I know how to do it, but I really usually don't want to start this task. And in the office, maybe you have a complicated project and you know for the next step you have to find some emails, maybe two emails and read these emails again because you have to remember the last step. And it's really nasty and uncomfortable. I have that sometimes that I know, okay, I have to start, but I don't want to. And I think all of us know that problem and most don't know how to deal with that. So they just postpone it. They say, ah, nice. I can read my emails first. I have to drink a coffee first and then I can start. Or I have a different task um, and I will start then. So you postpone the tasks because you have that feeling of blurriness. I really don't know what it is. And so I'm a bit scared of that task. And I'm sure you also know that once you have started and then later you say, wow, that was only 30 minutes of work. And why again did I postpone it for four weeks? You know, I had this eye-opening experience for myself when I really had a task. It had to do with finding errors in a very, very complicated IT environment. And I really didn't know where to start, where to stop. And it was so complicated for me. What should I do first? And I really was a bit scared and I said, okay, I do it tomorrow. Okay, I do it tomorrow. Okay, I do it tomorrow. And then finally I did it. And then I learned two things. Number one, wow, that was only 30 minutes. Why was I so scared? Number two, oh, I postponed that for four weeks. A whole month The task was unresolved because I was too scared and I had more important things to do and I could just have done it. So for these things where I know there are some hurdles, something that stops me from doing that when I have that feeling, I should do it but I don't do it, then a very good technique is the 20 minute speed run. What you need? A timer. What I like, I like analog timers like a sand clock, a kitchen timer, something like that. Or they have nice timers on the internet. There's a site called onlinestopwatch.com. They have a timer which looks like a bomb, for example, and you see how it burns down and after 20 minutes it can explode. Or a also famous aerotimer.com. Or you can just use the timer on your cell phone and you say okay now i will work exactly 20 minutes on that task no matter what i just do it without thinking i will do it 20 minutes now then you start the timer and i would recommend you not more than 20 minutes because it's extremely hard to concentrate more than 20 minutes on something you don't like 20 minutes is no problem when you're in flow But more than 20 minutes is, is hard. And it seems like Mount Everest, if you say I work one hour, one hour, yes. One hour is like a lot. You have to be really trained and really trained in focusing to say I work one hour on a task I don't like or I don't understand. Please set the timer on 20 minutes. And then you just start. You say, okay, 20 minutes. And then you see the timer, tick, tack. You see how it's going down. You see the bomb. So you see the end. And then you have the feeling, I have to hurry up. I have only 20 minutes. And then it becomes a little bit like a game. You say, how much can I do in these 20 minutes? Will I beat the clock? Something like that. And then you pick a piece of paper and start drawing 
the people and what do I have to do? What is the next step? What did he say last time? And then you will be amazed how quick sometimes you know what to do. Before you start to worry, you are already into the details. In my example, I would be in the system already in that complicated IT system. And then it's really starting to make fun, actually. And the rule of the 20 minute speedrun is after 20 minutes, I can quit without any bad feelings. And then I can do, okay, maybe I do the next 20 minute speed run um, today in the afternoon or tomorrow. But at least I did something, 20 minutes, and I know something more. And what's really interesting, in many cases, after this, I would say, after 15 minutes, you are already in a flow mode. That is so fascinating. You started And you work and you work and you say, okay, only 20 minutes. I do hurry up now. And then after 15 minutes, you are in a flow and you don't even look at that watch anymore. And if a bell doesn't ring, you don't even realize that sometimes. Or you say, okay, now that I'm working on it, I will do another 20 minutes. And sometimes another 20 minutes. And then that feeling is so good to tackle these problems. And if you do only 20 minutes, Also nice, no problem. You will feel better, I guarantee you, after 20 minutes. The method is called the 20 minute speed run, and you use it usually for tasks you don't like or that are unclear to you, and sometimes I use it when I'm just tired. The wall calendar method. This one Maybe it's not for everybody, but, and it's also not for every problem, but I can warmly recommend you. I personally use it literally every day. The idea is simple and compelling. You buy a wall calendar, a paper, it must be a old school paper calendar with a big black pen or a highlighter, green, red, whatever highlighter. For example, I have a Simpsons calendar hanging on the wall of my office. And then you say, I want to do this thing every day. For example, the story from Jerry Seinfeld, he had a world calendar and he said, I want to write one joke every day. And then he checked it off and, you know, he got into that habit of writing jokes every day. Because we all know that problem that we are motivated at the beginning to exercise, learn language, learn programming, whatever. And then after a couple of days we say, no, I'm too tired or not now, tomorrow and so on. Do something you can do every day. It must be small, which you can really do every day. And then check it off and this is really rewarding and after a couple of weeks and months or after a couple of days maybe you really see the progress and you look forward to cross it out. I really like it and I personally do another method because I have more than one goal. I want to work on the online course here. That's a work that takes a couple of months because you have to write the outline speak the audio, then cut the audio, then do the video and so on and so on. So you can say like six months of hard work or maybe 12 months of moderate work you have to put into a course like this, at least if you're doing it at night and not full time or something. But I also want to do sports. I want to exercise every week and I want to have active breaks where I do actively something I like, like playing Xbox or going to the movies. So I have basically three things I want to check. Then I thought of myself, I want to exercise three times per week, maybe, but not two hours, just 30 minutes or so at my home doing some kettlebell workout, something like that. So this three times per week, then three times per week I work on the course. Also, That doesn't mean two hours, it can also be only 30 minutes, but at least then I do something. And one time active rest, yeah. And uh, of course you can change it. Maybe I will change it to two times per week sports. I don't know. 
but you get the point. And I, I bought highlighters for the three colors. I have a blue for uh, brain work. I have the red one for sports and the green one for leisure. And I do it for eight or nine months now. And I do it really every day. And if I forget it, I can easily remember the next day what I did. And it really helps you stay on your track. It really helps you because otherwise you do nothing and waste your days and sit around, watch TV. But if you have a really something to draw on that calendar, you really want to do it. And if you say in that week, because one week is one line, you say, I want to exercise two times a week. You, you will do everything to do these two red crosses into that line. And even if you do it completely differently, you just say, I have one color black and I want to work on my project three times per month or five times per month. That's also good because even if you leave all the other cells blank, you can track, visually track and feel and touch the calendar, which is another experience than having some app and you will look into the app the first week every two hours or something and then you completely forget it because you do something else. I guess an app is not good enough. You can use that work calendar method for everything and say, for example, I want to do this project 10 times per month. You can easily see how often you did it. I can really recommend it. This is the reason why I did this course. This is the reason why I do sports at least two times per week. Please try it out. I have an Amazon link at that lecture. No, that was a joke. Go to your local shop, buy a nice calendar and tell me and the other students how that worked out for you. Do you know that feeling when you have a task scheduled in your project? And for example, you have four weeks time to do that tasks. Then guess what happens? In four weeks, you will be finished usually. And sometimes you even start like, I don't know, in the, in the last quarter or in the last week or something. We all know that problem. And the interesting thing is when you are really careful and you really listen to yourself or look at yourself, you see whether if it's four weeks or four days, or sometimes when you have worked as a consultant like me, sometimes you have only only four hours to do the same thing, the same presentation or the same project, project schedule. You, in, in all cases, you accomplish it somehow. And that thing is called, there's a name for it, Parkinson's law so that law says basically that you accomplish a task in whatever time you have and i'm completely sure you know that problem or you know that feeling that um, after school you have a homework or something and you always do it in the in the last quarter of the available time now the interesting thing is you can do like artificially you can just decide to always take the maybe the shortest or the second shortest time for something and that will make you really fast and really competitive you will be faster than all the other people because like everybody is thinking in this direction here if i have four weeks then okay now here i feel really good and then later maybe okay i feel kind of okay and then oh i have to hurry i really have to hurry and we all know that and we all usually do that. So I would really recommend you, if you have a task, act like I have finish, have to finish it tomorrow or something, you know. You should really be fast and really think it must be done fast. And you will not hurt yourself because if you do it fast, nobody is saying that you have to present it fast. You can, and that's a really nice feeling, you can you can put that work in your i don't know in your closet or in your desk into your desk and then you just lay it down for example you are here finished after 4 days and you just don't send it out so you have like quality check 
or something you wait, 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 wait. And then maybe here somebody's even asking you, are you already, did you begin that? Because nobody is really expecting that you'll be gone. And then you say, yes, of course, I finished. And then you're the winner and you just give it to your, your boss or the client, the customer. And that's always good because then you are the one who is like driving the stuff and you are always in control. And the worst case would be the, the, the other case that somebody is asking you here, did you start already? And you say, no, I didn't have the time because that always seems like you don't have control over your own time and you're like chased by something all the time. So I really can recommend you use Parkinson's law to your advantage. Use a short time frame, do that stuff as if you must do it quickly and then you can decide when you will show it to the others. In projects, we get emails all the time. It can be tens or even dozens per day. And the problem with the emails is you can read them really quickly and then you maybe forget the email and you forgot where to find that email and who is to follow up. Do I have to do the next step or the other person has to do the next step? And I have developed a system that works pretty well. So this is my mail program. Let's say Outlook again. And I have here my, my folders, inbox and so on. I assume you have already folders, at least inbox and send items, right? And in your inbox, you have, you get a lot of mails every day. First thing you should do is for each project or sub project or what's worth to be called a separate kind of thing, an own folder. What I sometimes, if I have many projects, I, I name these folders in an alphabetical order, like zero one and then the name and then zero two the name of the next sub project or something like that but let's assume you have only one project right now and maybe another older project just to show here more than one folder now this is your crown project and first thing you do every email in your inbox which comes and which is related to that project, move it directly there, unread, okay? Move unread, even if you have no time to read it. What I do not say is no, empty inbox. What do I mean? I mean that some time management experts, they say it's really important for your own mind and to feel well, you should have an empty inbox. That means you always try to keep this one here empty and move them into subfolders. In my opinion, that never works, really works out. Maybe you have a different opinion, but it's too time consuming to decide for every email, especially if it's an email, organizational email or I don't know, hotel booking and then some advertising. I don't want to spend so much time on these moving around of emails, just the emails who are really, which are really important. I do them into these subfolders and the other I just ignore. I have a really large inbox and I like that kind of because organizational mails and so on can be really easy searched by me. Okay, now I have all these emails in my inbox. What is the next thing I do? I have a color coding. And that is the important thing. Let's say an email, a neutral email is nothing. Yeah, right, no color, nothing. Then there are emails where I have to do something. And now comes the interesting thing. We have these labels in Outlook and in the mail program of Mac. They're called labels and colors. I have a label which is called, I guess in English it would be like, I have 
to act. And it's really, for me, it's important that it's not only the name of important, it has the name I have to act. So it's a real sentence for me to understand that. The I have to act gets the color red. And when I mark the email in this folder, you know that the, the, the whole email maybe gets red or it's a big red bumper on the side of the email or maybe it's a red flag in another mail program. So I have to act is red. And then I have, when somebody else has to act, so you can call it somebody else has to act or I'm waiting or okay, some, let's say somebody else. And those I have orange. Okay. And there is uh, another just important to remind. So emails may be really important things about the whole project, which may be important in two months or three or four months. So they're really, really important for later. And of course, not every email is important, but some are really important when things are explained. These I have in that uh, purple, purple color here. So I have three colors. I have red, I have orange, and I have purple. When I browse through the emails in, in Outlook, it's no problem. Then you can filter, assuming that you are now in this folder. So now the color coding doesn't work anymore because I colored all them in purple. So now I am in the folder, let's say, of the project. And I have a lot of emails with uh, different importance or color coding. These are red and, and red. And let's say one, one purple one and one orange or two orange. And important from these orange ones is that in most cases, the orange ones are sent items by myself. And that means that after I send an item to somebody, can you please do that? I immediately move that item into the inbox, uh, into the into the subfolder of that project. Move send items. Yes, and assuming that this whole window is project folder. What you can do is you can just filter. And that's what I do very often. I filter just on orange, for example. Then I get only these ones here highlighted and the others just disappear. Then I see what I am waiting for, who I am waiting for. Or I do the same thing with uh, what I have to do. And in my opinion, that works out really, really well. Maybe in the long run when you think, I'm waiting for that other person. Where's the email again? There the email is again. Or what do I have to do? And the goal is, of course, to unmark them. After I have done the red, I will, of course, remove the red color here. And the orange ones, if you're good, trying to be a good uh, project manager, you can also unmark them after the other person has done it. But I don't do that very often, to be honest because there are too many things you ask from other people. And for me, I have that task management in a different tool. I don't do that in Outlook. It's just if later I want to see that email, what did I request from somebody else? I can find that email very easy. And the purple ones, of course, they keep their color all the time because they will be important always. I do that system for many years now, I would say five, six years, and I'm super happy with it. It doesn't solve every problem, of course, but at least I'm the one usually who finds his emails fastest and the important emails and the emails where I have to do something. You know, there's this thing with to-do lists. Every to-do list I've ever seen is one-dimensional. That means you have a sheet of paper 
and you write your to-dos from the top to the bottom, right? That's one dimension, up and down. You have no left and right or something like that. And now recently there are some apps who add a little more value to that. So that's like a hierarchy. You can, for example, click here and then you have another window open and then you have sub tasks. You know what I mean? There are a lot of apps now to do apps who seem to make it easier, but that doesn't really solve the problem because if you have a task and then a subtask and then again a subtask, then you have like a tree. What you can never do is, for example, show that this task here and this task is related. In my opinion, the to-dos are not usually one-dimensional like the usual to-do list, but they are also not only like a tree, like the recent apps like uh, Wunderlist or Todoist or I don't know, all these apps have. I think to-dos are more like this. You have a to-do here, you have a to-do here and here, and then they are all related like a network. And in my opinion, there is no app which is able to draw that network. And this is why I just don't use an app. I just do it on a sheet of paper. And for several other reasons, anyway, I like sheet of paper, sheets of paper more than, than uh, apps. Because with apps, you usually get lost really fast. You have the new app and you write all your to-do list and you feel super good and you feel really well and super productive. And then after two days, it's, it's overwhelming and you don't use your app anymore. So at least it, that's my experience. And I've never met somebody who is really good with to-do apps and really, really productive. So in the, all the years in the last, I don't know, when I really started with that to-do list stuff, let's say around... 15 years in all the 15 years I never saw somebody who has an app really under control with um, really value and that's why I still use paper imagine this is your sheet of paper and I, I always lay the paper like this so this is my sheet of paper and I have this sheet of paper on my desk what I do is first thing is for every to do I make a little square then I write down the to do for example call Mr. XY then the next square write email and there's another square let's say more complicated get data and there's something super complicated which is called develop marketing concept okay so it starts like a usual to-do list like we all have like a usual two-dimensional to-do list but my to-do list has something magical and this is two things first thing is this little square here this is super important for me because I can draw notes in a meeting and then I know this square is always a to-do that means I can write different notes and everything uh, which I'm to uh, what I am told and then I know when there's a square this is a to do it's really easy for me to pass these messages so I can see there's a to do so the first magical thing is I like paint it's it feels a little bit like painting when I finished a to do I sit there for a couple of seconds
and do like what you are just seeing. I just like to fill and to paint this square. And it sounds maybe a little ridiculous, but for me that's a feeling like I did something. And if you have a big to-do list and after a couple of days you have all these filled squares, you feel really productive and you really feel really well. Um, some other people like to cross stuff out, but I personally think that doesn't look so well. <laughs> I personally like it more when I have something to really to fill. That was the first trick, but the really magic lies in the second trick and that is the, the second dimension. The second dimension means one dimension is only up and down, right? So now I'm going from here to here and when the list is full I take another sheet or something else. But usually, and that's the big problem of all these apps, after, after five or six to-dos you learn that these to-dos are related. That means when I see write email to Mr. Mr. Z and then somebody is telling me about ask Mr. Z about another project, let's say project B, whatever, that doesn't make sense, I know, but I want to say these are two different to-dos and because I'm on a sheet of paper and not in a stupid app, I can easily draw arrows between these to-dos and for me that's super cool and I have lots of pens, I have colored pens and then I can also make like highlight here, this is a color and this is a second color so I can I can make it really you know, really bold and explain myself, these to-dos are related. What I can also do is, I now clear the whole list because I, I need a little more space. For example, here I have a to-do and some other to-do and then somebody explaining me or I have new ideas and then I can directly here in this sheet of paper with these arrows, I always work a lot with these arrows, I can I can write more like okay um, a little more notes and here and here and what I always do is if this to do requires another to do for example I have to call that other guy first before I can do it I draw the arrow in the opposite direction and then I have here a second to do and then I can say call Mr. first, for example, and ask about blah, blah, blah. And this is now, you see here, I don't have so much space here, but on a real bigger sheet of paper, you have a lot of stuff to draw your notes, and that's really, really nice. And my, my to-do list sheets, they look completely like networks. So I have here relations, then I have here again something, and then maybe I have some important notes, then I make a little a little other square here, then I write here notes, and then I'm like, ah yes, okay, this is related to that, and then I write here something. And for me, it's a lot of fun to draw these things because it's for me it's a little bit like you know it's not so boring and it feels a bit like like art <laughs> okay art is maybe too much but if you have all these sheets of paper on your desk it's really you draw really relations between things that really make sense and you could never do that in an app and what i do is then when i have such a paper Maybe that paper is good enough for a week or if it's for an important project for a couple of weeks. But over the time, I try to solve all these to-dos and solve them. Only if I know the to-do is not possible, it's really, I don't have to do it anymore, then just for the sake, I will cross it out to show myself this to-do was not done. I hope you understand or you get what I'm meaning because we all think in these networks and in these relations. We don't think like A, B, C, D, E. And I've tried so many to-do list apps and it's always the same problem. 
you have a one dimension or sometimes you have a tree so you have a hierarchy but the leaves of this tree are also connected and with most apps you just cannot do that so you really need something to draw i would really love you to try it and give it a chance and maybe you will do like me and then you will never use a to-do list app again you have big piles of paper with many to-dos and you're super happy and super productive like me